good connecting to server recording right um now as as normal i'm just i'm going to say uh, a few words we'll have a uh, a few moments of silence just to focus the minds i'll light a candle and uh we can we can begin you'll speak a allah helga kindir mere og minni mogu hendala Hail Dago, Hail Daxini, Hail Nort of me, or read the Malcolm Little Dagasini, or gave it sit young to sit. And as I had all seen your heads young from the fold. Mall of man did give it up a magnum to me, a likeness in the middle. Brand of brandy, bren and spoon in air, only quake is up from the mother of money, first of Molikova and Tindalska of Dur. Flame is quickened by flame. A man from another man may become wiser, but from conceit may remain ignorant. Truth, like the sky, is above and beyond us all. Gods of our peoples and lands, may we spend this time together in friendship with you and with one another and use it to the common good with profit and with pleasure. Uh, I've had a, a, a message uh, this morning from Natasha, who is the wife of Anatoly, the uh, the main musician uh, of Neatland. And unfortunately, he's been in hospital for eight days, which is one of the reasons why you know, communication hasn't 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 uh, you know hasn't continued. So I, I asked her uh, to give him all our good wishes. And I said a, a prayer for his return to health. And uh, I hope we will have the pleasure of his company and get to listen to some music on another occasion. Um, and uh, I, I thank uh, today's speakers, both Lil and Vladimir for um, coming to, to, to the aid of what would otherwise be a moot without any um, anyone putting fourth uh, a subject um so uh i think yeah let's let's start with um lil are you are you, are you re re ready to go lil oh you're on mute if you can un unmute mute yourself sorry about that right. <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay and I think you can you, you can you can screen share at your yep. own will. So I, I would leave, leave it to, to you. I, as, I, as I I presume most people read in the notice, um, Lil uh, studied the the Baha'i faith and wrote a PhD about um, its um, uh, reception and development in England. Um, oh, I forget the exact dates, but uh, uh, I think. Uh, but anyway, the, 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 that 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 I, I think it's up to about the, about the nineteen nineties, wasn't it, Lil? Um, up to the nineteen thirties, my PhD. Oh, sorry, I, I, I got yeah. going. Um, on. Oh, okay. I thought about a second volume, but I should probably never get around to it. Well, <laughs> well, you, you might be the only one writing on that, so you'd uh, you know. <laughs> That, that, that will be a, a, an 80 but Oh, well, I should shut up and allow you to speak. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, um, first, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of the Baha'i Faith, but I will run through its basic tenets before I go, um, go, go into some of my other observations. Um, it claims to have over 5 million adherents and is the eighth largest and second most widespread religion in the world. Um, it uh, accepts financial support from nobody but its members, and it claims to have no political involvement. It's rooted in the millennialism of 19th century Shia Islam, although the vast majority of Baha'is today are not of Muslim heritage, and in many cases are absolutely unaware of its Islamic roots. Um, the, um, my, my, understanding of it now is that it is the most recent of the uh, 
um, Middle Eastern monotheisms, which of which the earliest is Judaism, um, and the one previous to the Baha'is is Islam. Um, like the other uh, monotheisms, it's universalist. In fact, I would um, postulate that the Baha'is go beyond universalism to globalism, to actually looking towards a what they, they actually use the term a new world order based on a single world government. But their beginnings are in um, Iran, in the Sheikhi School of Islam, which was a religiously conservative movement with an emphasis on eschatology. Um, it developed um, from that a one, one of the adherents of the last of the um, Sheikhi uh, mullahs was a man um, who entitled himself the Bab. Um, there are no pictures of the Bab, but he was obsessed with magic and talismans, and this is some of the, um, some of the work he produced. Um, he proclaimed the imminent, imminent return of the Imam, and he sent out his followers to proclaim the news. Um, the most important part of the Bab from Baha'i's perspective, well, there's two, two points. One is that he said that another person would follow him, who would be he whom God will make manifest, and that that person would sort of start an entire new cycle of prophet, um, prophethood. And also he abrogated the Islamic Sharia and brought in his own Sharia, which um, is the clear break between the Babi and Baha'i traditions with um, traditional Islam. Um, he was executed um, and by firing squad and uh, after his death, the headship of the movement fell to Mirza Yahya, Yahya Nuri. Um, he was ineffective and eventually the leadership was taken over by his half-brother, who is the most important of the Baha'i prophets, Baha'u'llah. Um, he, um, he is the one that they kind of uh, look upon as the founder of the uh, Baha'i faith um, and has a much uh, higher, uh, bigger role than, than the Bab does, although they're technically um, twin manifestations. Um, he was a prisoner of the Ottoman Empire for most of his life, but that didn't stop him, um, what the, to use the Baha'i terminology, revealing thousands of tablets, which um, are believed by Baha'is to be revealed directly from God. Um, he had 14 children by his three wives. Um, five of his sons predeceased him. And when he died in 1892, his eldest remaining son, Abbas Effendi, who took the name Abdul Baha, the servant of the glory, uh, be became the leader of the movement. The importance of Abdul Baha in this is that he visited the West several times. Now, whether or not the Baha'is ever expected their religion to spread so quickly to the West is not really clear, but um, because the two big missionaries that rocked up in America um, seem to have left almost on the day that Baha'u'llah died, which seems unlikely that that would have been planned. So it may have just been that they were two Syrian merchants who happened to go to New York and um, uh, one of them, uh, Ibrahim Karela, started teaching um, about the Baha'is and managed to develop quite a small community around him. Um, and that was what began the trickle into the West. Abdul Baha um, uh, cemented that with his visits. And during the First World War, he worked very closely with his successor, Shoghi Effendi, who um, they worked together on something called the Tablets of the Divine Plan. 
And the purpose of this plan was to get their existing Baha'i followers to become, they call them pioneers, not missionaries, but it was a plan to encompass the whole world. And when Abdul Baha died, Shoghi Effendi became what is called the guardian of the Baha'i faith. That was meant to be a hereditary role, but he didn't have any children. So when he died, um, the leadership and the, the way in which the faith is organized is actually very interesting. Um, the leadership now is with the Universal House of Justice, which is an elected body of nine men. And I'm, when I say men, I mean, you know, men, people with penises, not humanity. Um, they have to be male and they are elected by um, the, the membership. And in fact, the whole authority process within the Baha'i tradition now is that local spiritual assemblies are elected um, by the community that is always nine people when they have nine people the um they're supposed to move on to create another community and in doing that there's been a very very detailed plans of kind of um rolling the belief system out literally across the world and they have Neil, so do you, uh, um if people have got questions as it goes on uh, or, or would you take them or would you like to put this no, to the don't end mind. Don't mind at all. Okay, so because I know that maybe some things uh, it's good to ask at the time because you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. I mean, just what one question up earlier. Um, the two missionaries. You said they started creating interest. Was that amongst people of sort of Muslim background or, or what? what no. Kind of no. No. What? Uh, as we'll see, what happens in the West is they really kind of move into what we would nowadays call the kind of new age movement. Mm -hmm. And I look at this in a lot of detail in the, uh, in the British Isles. Um, they were picking up on Freemasons, people who'd been involved in things like occult movements, um, suffrage, the suffrage movement, um, early feminism is a very fertile ground, but mm -hmm. definitely not Muslims. And the first two guys that went to America we had never been Muslims, they were both Christians. Um, so they they would have had no interest. In fact, probably like most Middle Eastern Christians, quite Islamophobic. But may, may I ask why the number nine it was so significant? It's significant in um, yeah. <laughs> the Northern tradition, but presumably that has no relevance here. I, well, the, the, the Bab was very much into magics and nine is always a special number because of its kind of, um, you know, three by three. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other um, sacred number is 19 for the Baha'is. Really, really. They, they measure the uh, year in 19 months of 19 days. Um, it's, uh, the, uh, and, and, and uh, quite a lot of the early Baha'is were very into numerology. Mm. And uh, the, I mean, I, I I can go on about it, but it's a bit of a sideline to it. But Bab and um, all, uh, all all his followers were obsessed with the fact that various Arabic number uh, letters have numerical um, correspondences, and this whole idea of tables of correspondences was quite big for them. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, if nobody's got anything else, I'll, I'll rock on because I know I've only got half an hour. Oh, well, I mean, it's flexible. I mean, you know, it's flexible, please. Cool. Um, well, when Abdul Baha was in the West, um, this is the stuff he was, these were the principles which they still use. Um, they can all be rooted in the revelations of Baha'u'llah, except the possibility of harmony of science and religion, that one may have crept in. But all the other ones are um, kind of, you know, you can find quotations to back them up. But there is some of it that the way in which when it, particularly when it got to the West, I mean, it appealed very much to a kind of left of center, radical kind of milieu. Mm -hmm. And I think I first became kind of questioning about some of this. Um, at the time, I, I was doing an MA on women and religion, and this Catholic nun uh, said to me, um, ah, yeah, the Baha'is, the people who know other people's religions better than they know them themselves. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that, and I thought, you know what? 
you've got a point, lady, because, um, you know, they will tell Muslims there are prophets after Muhammad. They will tell Christians that the resurrection of Christ is merely um, a, a, a spiritual euphemism. Um, uh, oh, um, Hinduism is a monothe monotheism. All these religions are unified, but through their own prism of understanding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, their, their, their big thing on unity is certainly fundamental to the belief system, but it's their idea of it. And it's actually not that different from Islam, except that it does take on things like Buddhism, um, uh, Hinduism, um, hey, what, what, when you say it does take on, you mean it, it accepts them something? as valid religions. I mean, in Islam, the only um, divine religions are the monotheisms. But of course, they reconstitute all, uh, others as monotheisms. So, hey. um, and they, they have nine uh, religions that they absolutely accept. And this was one of the things that I kind of began to get... Uh, with <laughs> because um well i'll come to that later but yeah uh so the oneness of humanity i mean they've been very very big on that globalism uh they all move about all over the place um independent investigation of the truth is interesting you are meant to you can, uh, theoretically at any rate you cannot be born a baha'i um you have to become one and you have to investigate it for yourself mm. Equality of men and women was a good one, especially at the time when Abdul Baha was around. Now, one of the Bab's followers was a woman called Kara Talain, who um, is a significant Persian poet. I mean, she's a the genuine article. And she became a follower of the Bab and was one of his, um, uh, they call them letters of the living, like senior disciples. Um, she tore off her veil at a conference to indicate that there was no longer anything esoteric, everything was out there. And, you know, one, one of the other followers was so horrified by this, he slashed his throat. Um, but when she was repackaged for a Western audience, and you will still find this in Baha'i literature um, being produced at the moment, they refer to her as the first Persian feminist and the... <laughs> Uh, so, uh, a, a martyr for women's suffrage and there is a story that when she was being chucked down a well which was how she died um she saw her last words were um you can kill me but you will never stop the advancement of women which seems a slightly unlikely thing for someone to say as they're being chucked down a well really um but she was very very much packaged for a sort of early 20th century feminist audience and you can find accounts of her stories in suffrage newspapers at the time. Just, just to clarify that, you're saying she took off her veil and someone else slit his own throat. Yeah, so horrified by such an act. And, and died, was that the case? Oh yeah, yeah, you don't, don't survive, a, you don't survive a slashed throat like that. <laughs> so it was, quite, it was uh, quite a barnstorming performance that she gave, obviously. Um, this but, equality of uh, men and women, uh, how do they then rationalize the fact that the, the nine have to be only male? Oh, that's a big problem for them. That is a very yeah. big problem, and yeah. a lot of people bring it up. Um, I used to know, I used to know about her, and she, she quit because of that, because she said that women cannot advance, there's only so far they can go, and they weren't really equal. Oh, that absolutely. And Abdul Baha, though, he just said that it will all become um clear in the fullness of time and we're all waiting but that was the you know that yeah it was always a bit of a problem that one there's some other stuff like that like you have to get permission to get married but i'll come on to that because i, I want to talk a bit about the the tension between their kind of cultural marxist perspective on the one hand and a very traditional islamic um social structure on the other um yeah, elimination of every type of prejudice. They've been very keen on anti-racism and getting involved in kind of anti-racist stuff. Uh, compulsory education for all, especially women. And if you've got 
two children and you can't afford to um, uh, educate both of them. You have to do the girls as the priority. Um, so yeah, that's a nice one. Spiritual solutions to economic problems. I'm not quite sure how that works. I never did. I was behind for 30 years, but apparently so. And universal auxiliary language. They were very keen at one point on Esperanto. Uh, and we're very big in the Esperanto movement. I, I believe the daughter of the uh, originator of Esperanto yep. was a Lydia Zamenberg. Hmm. Yeah, she became a Baha'i. Hmm. Um, so yeah, they, 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 they were really, really keen on it at one point. Um, and of course, this universal peace upheld the World Federation. They're very big on the United Nations. Um, uh, uh, NGOs, that sort of thing. They're really keen on Agenda 21, uh, lots of stuff like that, really. Um, so that's how it is really presented. They're very keen on these principles. They still, a lot of the stuff you, a lot of the more complex stuff is, is not so obvious. Now, I began to realize um, as I studied it more, that the Baha'is, like most people, are not always 100% honest. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but we all tell our own stories. We all tell them from our own perspective. We're all um, the heroes of our own soap operas. <sighs> so uh, the way the Baha'is told their history, I began to kind of think, I want to know more about this. And that's why I ended up studying it. And I was looking specifically at the British Baha'is. Now, in the period I look at them, there is actually only about 100 of them. So it's easy enough to follow them through. And basically, um, I kind of look at them in terms of the kind of networks that they came into the Baha'i kind of milieu with. Um, there was a, um, a lot of interest in the suffrage movement, obviously, in the early years of the century. And most of the women involved in the Baha'i group had some uh, business with the suffrage movement. Um, Abdul Baha uh, spoke at a meeting with Charlotte Despard, who was one of the suffrage leaders. He also met um, Pankhurst. So they were, you know, he, he was being introduced to people very, very close to the top, in fact, actually at the top of the Votes for Women movement in, in Britain. And that I think is an indication of why, what starts to happen is he starts to answer the questions of the people that are his followers. And he gets pulled, if you like, onto their ground. Um, there is um, uh, stuff about equality of men and women in the uh, writings of Baha'u'llah, but there's certainly nothing about suffrage and all this sort of stuff. Basically, he's picking up on what he's being asked about and moving further and further onto their discourse. So the suffrage movement and the, the whole thing around rights of women become very, very central to his message while he's over here. Um, socialism, a, no, a number of them had been involved in the Independent Labour Party. So again, he's being questioned on that sort of stuff. What does he think about it? Um, and it kind of makes the, him move into their milieu, into their... Uh, their, their placements, if you like, and he starts to kind of address their questions using their language. One of the biggest groups that come around it are people who've been invo involved in things like the cult groups and Freemasonry. Lots of them are Freemasons. Well, I say lots of them because the vast majority were women, so they couldn't have been, but most of the men had been involved in either occult groups or Masonic groups. Um, the chap in the uniform in the picture is a guy called Wellesley Tudor Pole, who some of you may have come across. Um, 
Is he, is he related to Edward Tudor Pole? Yes, he is. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I um I mean in oh I will ask I'll ask him next time I see him then good um it's probably I think he's his great uncle um really interesting this, guy the, um this this this, this, this Judah Paul that you refer to said is someone that the rest of us might want to have heard about oh Edward Judah Paul is an actor and he's oh. a, a pop musician who, who produced a, a well known single I think. Uh, um men of a men with a thousand swords or something last century but he's oh, okay. uh yeah he's he's I mean, he, sword to thousand men was the song thank you mick thank you <laughs> <laughs> but he's um yeah he he's a great character and he also appeared in the sex pistols film a great rock and roll single yeah yeah and he um he used to hang out uh, with a few of us, including Jonathan Bowden, so he's an interesting guy. Anyway, let's, so, sorry, Lou, thank sorry. You, no, you. that's fine, yeah, I mean, um, the, 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 Tudor Pole is one of these people that, you know, if you scratch anything uh, around sort of occult movements at the beginning of the 20th century, you come across him. Um, he was a very interesting guy, and exactly what he was into, I do not know. But he seems in the Second World War, at least, to have had the year of, of Churchill and the King. So how he was, he was a biscuit manufacturer from Bristol. So how he managed to move in such elated circles, I do not know. I, I tell you one reason, he, he's related, he's a descendant of Henry Tudor, one of the kings of England. In, well, he claimed, well, <laughs> there you so go. I believe, yeah. Well, he, uh, he claimed, um, he was in one of the things he was involved with was a thing called the Order of the Table Round, which um, was a sort of one of these sort of small occult fraternities. And the thing is, he is related not only to the Tudors, but also to the Pole family, which were Catholic martyrs under the Tudors. So he had this incredible bloodline. Of, Apparently so. And this chap, Neville Meeking, who was running the Order of the Table Round, um, claimed to be a direct descendant of King Arthur. So the pair of them together um, were kind of really on a, a on a big thing about their kind of background in um, in, in sort of mystical uh, British history and stuff. And the, there's a whole stuff I can go on about the Order of the Table Round and and also Stella Machutina, which was a, uh, an offshoot of the Golden Dawn. Loads of them were buzzing around it as well. Um, and Pole, of course, is sort of obsessive about Glastonbury. And he finds this, this bowl in a, apparently, in a uh, stream in Glastonbury, and he relates it to the Holy Grail. And in fact, this bowl was shown to Abdul Baha when he visits the um, the Poles' house in Bristol, and interestingly, he took it, blessed it, and said nothing, which is probably wise, I think. Um, but another person, the, the the woman in the picture, is a woman called Alice Buckton, and she was another big player in Glastonbury. She bought the um, site, which is now the Chalice Well. And she did so on the instructions of Abdul Baha. And she also she ran this kind of um, uh, hostel for pilgrims in Glastonbury. And there's a whole bunch of stuff about her that I can go on, but I won't bore you with. But um, one of her guests was Margaret Murray. And Margaret Murray uh, points out that it's when she's in Glastonbury with Alice Buckton that she first started talking about the witch cult and wondering about that. And, you know, that was where her interest in um, witchcraft and, you know, we all, uh, and how that then later inspired Gerald Gardner and Wicker. So these guys were actually into some stuff, which I think the modern Baha'is would be absolutely horrified by. <laughs> this is not what they're into now. But there was something then that was was very, very much more, um, well, frankly, interesting. Um, most of these more interesting guys didn't stay with it. Um, they drop out after the First World War. Um, 
and the whole thing becomes very much um, more pedestrian, really. Um, they spend a lot of time there building their administration, which is this kind of structure of nine people, elected memberships and, and all that, um, which is their route of authority, and in spreading their beliefs worldwide. Um, because of the tablets of the divine plan, anybody who um, can is asked to go and spread the faith somewhere else. And that, that's how they manage to kind of get it all over the place. Now, um, skipping through this, because I recognize that the time is short. I wanted to- but Neil, I mean, I, you know, I, please don't, don't, you know, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, Anything that's interesting, we, we, we are, I, I think, uh, uh, have ears to hear. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll just go, I'll, I'll say a little bit then about their beliefs. Um, they have a linear view of history. And they talk about something called progressive revelation. And that is basically that, man, they call what other people would call prophets, manifestations of God. And they bring books and laws to, go, to govern in a divine, divinely inspired communities. This is very, very similar to Islam, the concept of Rasul and Nabi. Um, uh, Baha'u'llah, though, is the, is the promised one of all ages, the universal manifestation of the unknowable deity. The deity is unapproachable, only approached through the manifestations. And um, they a lot of the... Uh, I mean, he, the, there are things like there is no distinction whatsoever among the bearers of my, my, my message. They all have one purpose and their secret is the same secret. Um, so the idea all prophets of God are basically the same. Um, and I'm going to, I think I've talked a bit about their beliefs, their, their practices. Um, that that's where really the roots of Islam are, are very clearly shown. Um, you do you declare the faith, you pray in a specified manner at specified times. Uh, you, how, I mean, is is that is that like sort of five times a day, like in the Islamic times. three times? And uh, does one say this the same thing, or or is there something different? So, to, well, to, again, you know, it's been modified for Western audiences. Um, you're supposed to do um, that. Th there are three options basically. You can either do um, the long obligatory prayer, which is not dis well, it is actually much longer than Muslim prayers and it involves washing and um, uh, various genuflections and stuff. That's the long one. Then there's the medium one that you have to do three times a day at uh, appointed times, uh, again with genuflections and, and uh, washing, or there's one that takes about probably 30 seconds and can be done you know, anywhere, anytime. So they, you know, they have kind of uh, modified it to make it easy for people, I think. Mm. Are, uh, are the times um, astronom um, uh, as astronomically determined as with the times of prayer for, for, the, um, for the For the, for the, ugh, getting them out. Uh, yes, they are. Um, dawn, dawn, noon and dusk for the, for the uh, triple one. And again, you know, most most uh, Middle Eastern Baha'is would use a prayer, a prayer mat and stuff. Um, Western ones presumably don't unless they've been um, involved with Middle Eastern Baha'is. They it's have a direction. They, are they facing Mecca or something like that? No, they fa they, they face Haifa, which is where the um, okay. uh, which is where the Baha'i headquarters are. But yeah, there, there is a Qibla uh, in much the same way. Uh, and there are um, there's there's fasting as well between sunrise and sunset for one of their 19 day months every year. Um, and um, there's a, a, the law of Hukukala, which is the uh, portion of God where you have to give um, arms based on um, the amount of money you have. But so that that is all actually very kind of um, Islamic, if you like, in its uh, in its thrust. Um, now, what has actually been kind of problematic for them in a way has been that they don't, as I said at the beginning, they don't take money from anybody else. 
and they're very strict on that. So they can only get money from their own members. And they took a very big hit with the Iranian revolution um, because a lot of very, very wealthy uh, Baha'is, um, I mean, they, they, they've taken a, a really bad kicking um, in Iran and the money that was coming from there has dried up. So they are very dependent on their diaspora in the Middle East. They've got a lot of Persian Baha'is um, living in the Gulf states and they're big funders. And uh, of course, in the West, the West has obviously those strong currencies. So just put that on one side for a moment because that means that like they need to keep the the wealthy communities going in order to fund the rest of it. And they have some quite expensive outlays. Um, I showed you the picture of the building in Haifa. There's a whole kind of um, compound in Haifa, um, which uh, has got all sorts of phenomenal buildings and stuff. So it's, uh, that must cost them a fair bit. And they've built temples. Um, in various places. They're just putting one up in the Congo at the moment. Um, but again, this, this is all very expensive stuff. So there's, there, there's high outgoings, that's all I'm saying. Can I ask uh, a question? Yeah. Uh, actually, two questions. The first one, I was really interested in the spiritual solutions to economic problems. Yes. Which you kind of uh, schemed over, but I'd, I'd, really, I'd really be interested in knowing more about it. And secondly, um, Lil, why is it we can't see you? Oh, is I can... it for technical uh, reasons? Or are you no, in no, a location? I, no, I just didn't put the thingy on them. I can. <laughs> I'll put it on. No, 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 I'm only asking, are you afraid of being uh, persecuted? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I just don't like seeing myself. Oh, I see you. Oh. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah, there you go. Unusual for a lady. Oh. <laughs> there you go. There. Hey, I hope that makes you a bit more of a talking head. Oh, um, wow, you look wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, the, the economic teachings are very vague. Um, they talk about the eradication of extremes of wealth and poverty. Which is a bit like buy 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 short and sell long, you know. It's a kind of truism, but they don't really give a lot of um, detail of how this is going to be done. But they do have a number of um, uh, committees and subcommittees involved with this. I, I must be honest; I've never been interested in it in depth. But you could find out more about it if you so wished. Um, um, the other controversies, yeah. Um, they've got scholarships been a problem to them. Um, I think they've been quite clever in recognising the danger of left-wing American scholarship. And they've kicked out people if they have been too difficult. Um, and they've managed to kind of face down quite a lot of um, maybe what could have been opposition over things like um, women in the Universal mm -hmm. House of Justice. There was indeed a, um, a paper written oh, good many years ago now, for about 25 years ago now, but half the people whose names were on it were, were pushed out um, because it was a... a uh, they said going yeah. against the uh, mm. system. So, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they've been quite, I think a lot of their American academic uh, members tended to be kind of quite left of center and kind of from the, like the 1970s radicals. And that has, that has been one of the tensions. Um, so what's the, 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 what's the tension uh, because well, yeah so between which I mean, two? Well, for example, on things like race. Now, the, the Baha'is have been really um, anti-racist. In fairness to them, from the beginning, um, they uh, Abdu'l-Baha 
when he was in somewhere in America, they tried to get him to sit at a segregated table and he went round and he got all the place name, name place thingy bobs that they put on uh, tables for where people to sit. And he shuffled them and threw them down and said they all had to sit integrated. And that was back in like 1913. So there'd always been this sort of thing. Um, but they kind of came a bit of a cropper really with um, doing very well in South Carolina where they were getting lots and lots of African-American converts. And people began to say a bit like, whoa, is, you know, we're gonna turn into a black church. And they started to put the brakes on. And, and that has since been, you know, uh, brought up um, as indications of racism within the organization and so on. So what was it that they, they felt that uh, if, if the, the, the black population increases a lot, then it, it, it would sort of create a situation where perhaps the, the white people wouldn't feel so yeah, able off, to yeah. go. So yeah, yeah, interesting. And I, you know, you can see where that's come from, and you know, um, but that that caused quite a lot of tension because other people saying, well, if if, if Bahá'u'lláh has called them, then they must be, you know. Is that part um, of this leftist thing that you're talking about? The, yeah, the yeah. counter leftist, because so many of the principles sound, seem to be left to begin with. Exactly. So yeah. what you've got is a tension, particularly in the West, between people who've been brought in on these quite leftist things, mm -hmm. but they won't ever go the whole way on them, the, the organization. I mean, for example, with the Black Lives Matter thing, I mean, although I'm no longer a Baha'i, I see quite a lot of the um, uh, traffic on various Baha'i websites. And um, it's been really interesting because people have been saying that the leadership is not supporting it. And yet at the same time, you know, individual Baha'is have <coughs> Black Lives Matter all over their stuff. And I know that there are academics who are deeply involved in race theory, which Baha'is cannot, well, I can't see how they could really support from the normal perspective of Baha'i thinking. But, you know, that, it's, there, there is a tension. You get it as well. I mean, women in the leadership um, has been mentioned the whole thing, I mean, again, although they will talk the talk at one level about um, rights of women, when it actually comes down to it, there are checks and balances on it. And, you know, it's, it, again, one of these things that and the whole thing around the family um, for these kind of leftist people is very difficult. You're not supposed to have sex outside marriage. You're not supposed to actually kiss anybody until you've married them. You have to give a dowry, you have to give, um, you have to get parental permission. Uh, so all in all, it's kind of not the version of feminism that most Western people are into, yeah? Same you all... said one isn't allowed to kiss someone unless one is married to them. I yeah. Mean, um, <laughs> so that, that I, I've never heard that from any, yeah. That, that yeah. Is... Oh. That, that may not, again, you see, in the West, that won't be what is being... I mean, that, that, that also in Islam, where you're not supposed to kiss someone, especially in public, unless you're married to them. Absolutely. I mean, I gave a peck on the cheek to a lady, a lady friend in Qatar, in Doha, Qatar, and she told me, be careful, you could be arrested. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And I mean, the thing, this is where I'm saying there are, there are massive tensions, because on the one hand, you have a kind of Middle Eastern morality underpinning this, but because they've flogged it in the West as a kind of um, left of centre, uh, radical type of spirituality, the, the things are starting to come to tear it, will eventually, I think, tear it apart, because the, things like um, gay, um, LGBT rights and stuff, um, you're not allowed to be gay, mm. which is a big problem for a lot of these, um, you know, the sort of the, the left of centre ones. Mm. And that, that, that bubbles up a lot, a lot. Um, so, and then the other big issue with them is Zionism, because um, their headquarters are in what is now the State of Israel. And in order to maintain it, 
they have, I think the kindest way I can put this is been very friendly to the Zionist government. Had to be. Well, 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 what, what, why it is in, in, in Israel? I mean, what, what, what was, I, I suppose some of the, the Arab states would be, obviously regard them as a, as a you know, um, a, a false kind of uh, turning and that, that, you know, so. Well, it's maybe not because I mean, one of the places that if the Hajj is done properly, you are supposed to go to, to Al-Quds in Jerusalem because it's, you know, um, uh, but the, the, the reason it's there is because it was um, in the writings of Baha'u'llah um, that he would pitch his tent on Mount Carmel. And he did. And that's where their, their, their big edifices are. Um, I mean, basically, Palestine has been important to all the monotheisms for whatever reason. Mm. Um, and they have completed that tradition. So they've, they've, they've built this um, huge edifice there. They do not recruit or um, proselytize in Israel at all. Um, if an Israeli tries to become a Baha'i, they will kind of block them and say that they must go elsewhere if they're really interested. Mm. What, what, why is that? Is that because they don't want to cause a, a bad uh, reaction from the authorities and so forth. Yeah, and I mean, even early on, I mean, uh, in I think about 1920s, there was an, um, a Jewish family in Bournemouth called the Kings, who um, who were kind of bringing up Baha'i teachings at the local synagogue. And they get told then, you know, don't make waves at that, do, you know, join something else kind of thing, if you want to start teaching. So they obviously always had a bit of, and again, you know, I mean, your man Tudor Pole had a lot of contacts in that part of the world. And there is, um, and he did several public meetings with some very important British Zionists. So it's kind of quite interesting what was going on there. They certainly had a, uh, an issue a few years ago. Um, it was an Israeli soldier, a member of the Israeli defense thingy um, which was killed and um, it transpired that this unfortunate young man's mother was a convert and there were kind of very um, pious Jews who did not want him to be buried in a in the Jewish manner because he wasn't a proper Jew he was obviously good enough to die for Israel but not to be buried and um, the Baha'is very kindly helped out and allowed him to be buried in a Baha'i cemetery in Haifa, but officiated by um, liberal uh, Jewish clergy. So they're not beyond helping out when it suits them. That's all I'm saying. Um, so they, they, there are quite a lot of issues within the Baha'is which um, are, you know, maybe not as comfortable as they would like. And I mean, how I, uh, just because um, instead you said how, how it had affected me. I mean, I got really interested when I sort of found out about all these guys who'd been into the occult and these other spiritual paths. And I thought that that was the green light for me to carry on because I'd always been involved with um, paganism. I was a member of two covens while I was um, a Baha'i. Um, and I wrote a number of uh, scholarly articles and presented them about things like the Baha'i faith and Wicca, um, Baha'i faith and uh, indigenous European religion. And it was kind of quite weird because I was expecting someone one day to kind of pull me up on it, but nobody ever did. Nobody ever said, you know, is this perhaps more than just a passing interest? And um, what was it that you, you actually found the. Um, uh, um, specific sort of particularity of the, the pagan traditions complemented quite well these these kind of vast universal uh, exactly. uh, ambitions yes there yeah. are ways in which you can kind of um you, you can play it mm. and i think to some extent that, that 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 was what i was doing um i kind of uh, yeah I, I i and i think what really was the uh kind of i got involved with um what one of the um, ethnic groups that uh, Baha'is are always very keen on are First Nation people. 
And I got involved with quite a lot of um, Native American Baha'is and talking about indigenous religion. And the, for me, the interesting thing was the Baha'is were starting to say that um, white buffalo woman could be a, a manifestation of God. That's not official yet, but they were starting to kind of, um, I, I've seen scholarly articles making that, um, that statement. And well, let me just ask you, you had mentioned that they were, um, the Baha'is know about the other religions probably often more than the people that those religions themselves. Does that extend to paganism? Are they familiar well, with paganism? And do they accept that as one of the religions? Well, that, that was what I was really testing out. Would they accept it? And I mean, yeah. I know in my, I knew in my heart of hearts for quite a long time, the quick answer was no, because they're a monotheism. Yeah. And uh, there are no, um, uh, there are no identifiable manifestations of God that they can pick up mm. in yeah paganism um is um zoroastrianism uh, an ex uh, accepted yes. by them but it isn't that based on a fundamental sort of duality between sort of good and evil again they they, they will like they do with hinduism they will sort of um what's the word i'm looking for they'll, they'll, they'll recast it in their own image when it suits them mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean they they might well have been able to have done it with, um, with um, Anglo-Saxon heathenry. I don't know, you know. Mm. Uh, <coughs> find somebody and claim he was a manifestation of God. But I didn't actually think that was going to happen. Really. Um, because they are, de um, they're, they're ultimately, they are a, a monotheism. And they are the latest incarnation, if you like, of mm. the... Yahweh, Jehovah, uh, the Abrahamic, uh, you know, sort of family. Uh, but Ben, did you want yeah, to? Yeah, I had a, I just had a couple of pedestrian questions. Um, I mean, observation when we're talking about uh, sort of the inconsistencies or cognitive dissonance within the uh, Baha'is. I mean, there is a tendency within, generally speaking, monotheistic religions, where in theory it's supposed to be based on scripture and dogmatism, but mm -hmm. how the entire thing is constructed is based on political realities. And usually those political realities are um, for the purposes of imperialism. So putting claim on all peoples and uh, uniting them as a way of um, dividing and ruling. Baha'i seems to be a very, um, a very extreme uh, and purified version of that because um, if one looks over the principles uh, it, and I'm just a pedestrian on this, but it appears to be a, a, a very much a political religion or um, mm. to an extent like a, a, a raw political power veiling itself, um, you know, uh, as a religion or a kind of ritualized political cult. And I was wondering to what extent um, you would agree with that um, and whether the origins of Baha'i, because um, you did sort of start on this, but I was wondering if the origins were similar to Freemasonry, um, originated within the ruling classes, so the, the elites of the Near East as a sort of long-term project for um, raw political power, essentially, and uh, did they fail in their plot, to, plot, of, plot for world domination? I think you're right. I mean, I think there is a political side to this. Um, the, your average Baha'i would never admit to that. But there clearly is an agenda here, much like there is in political, political Islam. And I actually think that the real under, my underpinning of Baha'i is the possibility, it's a sort of Islam light. Um, mm -hmm. It does, it much the same as Islam, it has this idea of a world, you know, a, a world dominated by one religion with one law code. That is there. And I think if it ever, it, it will either disappear completely fairly soon, or it is the, uh, I believe it's the only thing that could take over from Islam in the Middle East. And that is why they are so persecuted, because actually it's a form of liberal Islam which would go much better with capitalism than current version of Islam. 
I mean, if you look at Islam in the early days of the 20th century, one of the big, the, the big reformers, people like Ataturk and Muhammad Abdu. Muhammad Abdu was a close personal friend of, of Abdul Baha. And a lot of their stuff, you know, there's correspondence between them, it's well documented. Um, I think there was a desire, uh, um, at the time, um, Islam looked like it could have a reformation, rather like um, Christianity did with Martin Luther. And that that was the purpose of the Baha'is. It was to um, reshape Islam so that it would accept things like interest on money. You know, ah, because the, the timing that one looks at it, it sort of starts to dovetail with the beginning of European colonialism. Mm. And whether there's an attempt to mirror that and integrate it within um, the global economic system. And realistically, do you think that their plans and the reason why they're having problems today is because of decolonization, um, obviously Nasser and Arab nationalism and modern concepts rather putting spanner in the works in terms of we, we now live in a multipolar polar world to some extent and still do. I think basically they've been overtaken by events. I mean, when they were all kind of happily banging on about, you know, rights of women, well, now, you know, rights of women, that, that's kind of written in constitutions all around the world. You know, it, um, universal education. Well, for most of the West, um, you know, that, that's, that has happened. So that basically the, it's a bit like, you know, the, the, the way to stop the hunt is shoot the fox. And I think that's what's happened to them. They've, their, their agenda is actually kind of quite, um, quite old fashioned now. And because they have these, um, because it is religious and it is based at one level on, on text, they can't get round things like um, uh, homosexuality. They try, the, the, the radical ones try, but it is, um, you can argue that the word that they use is actually uh, translates as pederasty. Therefore, it's not talking about, you know, people going off having a happy gay marriage together. Um, it's something that's just about boys and, you know, you can walk around. But the bottom line is there is this, there is a contradiction, you know, equality of men and women, but hey, you've still got to get a dowry. You know what I mean? So it's like, at the time, at the early, in the, I think in the beginning of the 20th century, it was, it was a real contender for being a, a, a reformed version of Islam. I think now mm. Islam's gone the other way and they've been left with a kind of rather dated, it's not really very radical anymore, it's just a bit... But is it not the case left. that doctrinally there are no Muslims at all? Leaving aside uh, all these Western uh, fads like uh, LGBT and uh, feminism and so on, the key point of the Baha'is, in my opinion, is that they place, they do not, do not allow Muhammad to be the last and final prophet, to be the seal of a prophet. Oh, they they do not that. allow yeah. any book to be brought after the Quran. And those are the two key benchmarks which disqualify them in the eyes of Muslims. Everything else, all this wonderful uh, Western stuff like LGBT and so on, really is not the key. No, they get round the seal of the prophets by saying that um, Muhammad was the seal of a particular cycle of prophets. Yes, so that's... Um, that, that, that the seal is broken by the Bab. Well, that's verbal, um, purely it, verbal. It's verbal it's absolutely, and it, the uh, the Armadia used the same kind of arguments. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, um, but, um, sorry. Sorry. Uh, um, oh, I, I was just going to say, are, are there other um, are there things that that you found very uh, sort of aided your your kind of spiritual life when you were in that tradition, uh, and things that you you know have still. Uh, have an effect and perhaps things think you still practice now that help you engage with the divine? Well, I mean, it certainly taught me to meditate. It certainly taught me to pray. And it gave me, I mean, it probably, I mean, the fact that I'm living in Glastonbury has probably got quite a lot to do with Alice Buckton. Mm -hmm. 
um, and the, the idea of, of indigenous religion as well was what really uh, that came from from that as well. So I mean, in your life, maybe it, it was a very a very useful uh, uh, access to certain things that yeah. you at that time perhaps you weren't so aware of. So I mean, you know, gave me, you know, I, I I I was married to a Baha'i. We lived in the Middle East, so you know, I've had uh, quite a lot of exposure to the Middle East because of it, um, mm -hmm. and quite interesting exposure to it because um, not as a tourist. I mean, I've been arrested. Yeah. And, um, Bunged in, you know, questioned in Cairo and things like that. So. Oh, really? Because of, of your connections with the Baha'i? Yeah. Really? I've um, got a brother in law who was banged up for a few years, a few months actually, for photocopying a prayer book. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks so much for that, that really stimulating account. Um, before we, we um, move on to Vladimir, would, uh, does anyone have, who perhaps hasn't spoken, does anyone have any, any questions to um, Lil? I have a comment, and that just is that with the Parliament of the World's Religions, when they restarted, they had the centenary celebration in Chicago in, oh, in yeah. 1993, the Baha'i played a very key seminal part in that whole organization and the whole uh, the continuance of the uh, parliament. So. Yeah, they're very keen on that sort of stuff. And yeah, I think yeah, they, they were at the first one, weren't they? Um, yeah. And Chicago's uh, one of their holy cities and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Can I have a question? Yeah, Hello? yeah of course, go on. Oh. Go ahead. Hey, um, so why did you leave the Baha'i faith? Like, what was the... I, I, I couldn't live with the contradictions anymore. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, um, I kind of, there, there, there's no, I mean, I, I would have liked to have asked them uh, to, to have brought it up perhaps more point blank about, you know, would you ever accept uh, indigenous uh, religious belief in Europe? But I knew, you know, I knew the answer. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, thank, thanks so much, Bill. That, that was... <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I yeah that exceeded my um, expectations of how interesting the, the Baha'i faith is. So so th thank thank you very much for that. Um, yeah yeah it was very very enjoyable. Um, um, Vladimir, are are you still there? And, and would you like to um, uh, you know be, begin your your um, talk about about uh, uh, yeah. Vladimir, yeah, over yes, to you, Vladimir. sir. I just ask you to wait for a couple of seconds. I should take a sip of water in the kitchen. All right? Okay. I'm, 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 one second, yes? One okay. second. Uh, um, yeah. So. No, thank uh, you, Lil. That was a very illuminating talk. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah I, I thought so. It was very good. Um, greetings, um, Alexandra, um, and greetings, uh, Brian and James. Uh, I haven't uh, spoken to you before. Uh, good, 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 to, good to have you here. Um, Frank, how how are you in your in your hotel while the, your place is being done up? Are you all right? Oh, I'm living the life of Riley. It's uh, <laughs> very plush. Having a breakfast and two uh, hot meals a day, all part of a deal. I'm, it's more, more than I'm getting at home. Probably yeah. come out of it quite fast. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're um, yeah, you are you are you ready to go now? Are you are your lips and uh, throat uh, suitably moist? <laughs> yes. So okay, let's go. Uh, okay, so uh, my speech should be about uh, like a special sort of Russian sectarians, so to say. And uh, in the beginning, I would like to put some attention on the very name of these people, because it might bring some confusion for non-specialists. So basically, 
these people named themselves like uh, God's people, God's people. And in the popular literature, they should be called usually like whips in Russian, Klisti. And then there is a, a page from English Wikipedia in, in our chat. I just send it as just, just in you. case if someone would like to, to have some more additional information. Uh, why whips? Basically, these people also call themselves like Christ. Christ mm -hmm. in Russian is Christ, Christos. And if you change R for L, you get Christ, Christ, Christ. That's why from Christ, they became like whips, so to say. But also whipping is a common practice for these people. They whip themselves like a Shia Muslims, for example, or some askets in, in India. And then, uh, so in a certain way, they're very similar to Quakers. So they quake, they shake, they just they're trying to get the ecstasy. Yeah, uh, Vladimir, we, what could you place them uh, historically? What, what, um, you know, when, when did they you know, come into being? And uh, yes. What you... yes, historically, mm -hmm, these people, this sect, uh, uh, came to the surface uh, first in the uh, uh, in the middle of 17th century. In the middle of 17th century, it was really like a difficult, a, a very strange and then hard period for, for, for Russia and for Russian states. Uh, uh, as we remember, uh, in the end of uh, uh, 17th century, 16th century, the last Rurikids, so descendants of Rurik, the founder of Russian state, the last Rurikids died out. And there was a, a very turbulent period in the history of Russia with a, a Polish invasion. And then the Poles, uh, the, uh, or the Poland and the great um, duchy of Lithuania occupied Moscow. And there was a huge battle for the Russian throne. And in fact, uh, the throne was conquered by the representative of uh, this Western Russian uh, aristocracy uh, with the roots in Poland and in a, a great duchy of Lithuania. Uh, now a couple of, a couple of uh, clarifications. So what we call great duchy of Lithuania is not just a Lithuanian national state. It's just a name, the geographical name, Lithuania. Uh, it was a name for the Western Russian uh, lands. And uh, there is a, difference between Lithuanians and Litvins. Lithuanians are a Lithuanian folk, as we know them, the population of modern Lithuanian Republic. And Litvins, very similar, they were uh, Western Russians. Uh, actually, the population of Belarusia are descendants, direct descendants of uh, Litvins. And the great duchy of Lithuania, it was just a Slavic state with the Slavic uh, 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 laws written in Slavic language, Western Slavic language is modern Belarusian language. So it was just a uh, battle uh, and contradiction between different, uh, we, we can say the like Russian tribes or Russian states. One was uh, the Tsardom of Moscow and another one was Western Russia or the Great Duchy of Lithuania with the support of Poland. And then it turned out the aristocracy of uh, the uh, Lithuania, the great duchy of Lithuania, they took over in Moscow and they brought their own like uh, history, their own religion, everything they brought to, to, to Moscow. And the, the religion of uh, those Western Russians was uh, the European, uh, the Catholicism from one point, but also they were Orthodox, but they were Orthodox according to the new Greek observance. That means uh, a new Orthodoxy. Uh, in the same time, the Orthodoxy of the Tsardom um, of Russia was different Orthodoxy. It was the old version of Orthodoxy. Uh, uh, came from, from Byzantium uh, for a few, several, uh, several, um, centuries before. 
So that's why. Uh, my, my understanding is that, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, it was Arch Pat uh, uh, the Patriarch uh, Nikon, I think, that thought that yes, the. Yes, exactly. Patriarch um, Patriarch was a carrier. And exactly. they were using the Greek Orthodox yes, tradition yes. as being the standard and trying to bring, bring things back. But uh, yeah, yes, some yes. people didn't agree with that. That is. And this, these people who were not agreed to, to Nikon, they were called uh, old believers. But the old believer, there is a two connotation of this, uh, of this term in, in Russian history. First, the old believers were a pre-Christian population who were like pagans, so to say. They were old believers in the, in the early Russian history. And new believers were Christians. And then after, in the, uh, in the beginning of the 17th century, the old believers were also uh, 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 the, the supporters of old version of orthodoxy. They called them, them, them old believers. And the new version of orthodoxy supported by Western uh, the Russians, mm, they were like new believers. That's why the old believers from one side, they are the old orthodox, from other side, the pre-Christians. And uh, the pre-Christians, of course, they could not exercise their pagan belief. They accepted, especially uh, if we speak not about intellectuals and uh, the uh, educated monks, but the, we speak about just ordinary people. The ordinary people, they still were like pagans in their mentality, but they accepted the rhetorics of Christianity. That's why they speak about Godfather and Christ and then uh, Madonna and uh, all kinds of saints. But their mentality was not Christian at all. They still um, kept their own uh, paganistic mentality. And uh, in the time of, uh, of this religious split with the Nikon Re Reformation, uh, the old believers were like isolated from the modern orthodoxy and from the European orthodoxy, from Greek and then Balkan orthodoxy and then uh, Ukrainian in the, the orthodoxy of the great duchy of Lithuanian. And they still try to, to keep their own understanding of, of religion and the, the old version of orthodoxy and the plus uh, like very, very special uh, uh, aspects of uh, pre-Christian uh, folk beliefs. No, I, I, uh, no, I just so that I, I, I believe that uh, one of the most important things they, they wanted to keep was the sign of the cross they made, which was slightly different from the sign of the cross that the Greeks made, which, which strangely is, is that I understand from in, in Greek orthodoxy, whereas the old, old believers, it, 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 it was this. Yes, Which yes, seems, that's, yes, formally that's it. Yes, exactly. It, it, it seems quite strange. And they also um, wanted to, to um, process in a clockwise direction, but the according to the Greek Orthodox dispensation, it was anti clockwise, which is unusual. Those are the two things that stuck out uh, I, yes. I, when I looked at the matter. The Sorry. Question, yes, but all this was just a formality. That's why the, those, the God people or the, the whips, the Christs, they were produced uh, in the community in the area of uh, old believers. So they were like a branch of old believers, but they, they were not just a, a, the Christian old believers. They really uh, put an attention on the somehow in a pre-Christian beliefs, even using the Christian rhetorics. And uh, those Christs, they um, initially, they were uh, spotted in the history uh, in, uh, in the middle of 17th century. But according to, to certain sources, this kind of people with the same mentality, you can find in Russian history even before, even in the 14th century, even before, that probably it was somehow we could find a succession between those uh, God people and the old sex in, still in, in Novgorod Rus, uh, like, uh, Bogomils from Bulgaria and all other kinds of Gnostic sects of Byzantine of Byzantine style. So they were really uh, 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 they were really uprooted uh, in, in, in Russian state as well. 
so and what is the point of the of those uh, God's people? Uh, the whole history, uh, known history, started with a, a person named uh, Daniela Filipovich, or to speak in English, Daniel Philip. So this Daniel Philip, he was born somewhere in northern Russia, uh, and he uh, he he got a revelation like. He is not just the Christ, he is the, the Godfather himself. So actually he is the Sabaoth, he is the Godfather. And he said, we should take a new, absolutely new religion. I am the Godfather. And that's why you should just throw away all religious books, including the old believers and new believers. It doesn't matter. All this is just scam. Just forget about, forget about it. And I am the Godfather. I give you... Uh, not intellectual teaching, but I give you just a spiritual teaching. You just follow me, do what I'm doing, and then you get uh, the, the heaven, you get the, the kingdom of the God's kingdom. And that was at the beginning. So did, did, did he identify himself then with um, the, the kind of father of Jesus in that sense? Is that what he Not, not, not with the Jesus. He was identified himself with the God creator. Yes, the far, yes, God the Father, yeah. God, God Father, yes. And he found uh, one of his, one of his um, followers, Ivan Suslov, uh, he was identified with the Jesus. He was Jesus, and then they got uh, also Madonna, Godmothers, and then uh, the, uh, Johannes, uh, the, the, how do you say, the Baptist, and uh, some other persons from, from the Bible. But they just used, as I said, they used the Bible's rhetoric just because they didn't have any other language. They were just a simple people with a different mentality, but they used all these Bible stories, but not because they were following, following uh, theologically uh, uh, the uh, Abrahamism. They just used it as a language. And so they built up their own, their own community. And then their own theology based on the idea that just everybody can be an avatar, so to say, an incarnation or Godfather or Christ that also there were many Christ, every prophets and not only in the Christianity, only in different on, in other religions were just Christ because Christ is a title and Jesus one, was just one of Christ's, but not the only one. Uh, and then there might be many other Christ's, the same, it, it might be many other avatars of God. It's in that case, it's very similar to, to Hinduism, where every guru might be a god, Shiva, Vishnu, or someone else, because yeah. they have a different mentality and different theology. It's not like in, a, in Abrahamism or in Islam and Christianity. That's why, so those people, somehow, they embody, incarnated this old uh, pre-Christian paganism or the old, this old religion, or maybe a pre-religion mentality, when it said that everybody can be the whole incarnation of the divine principle. And that was their story. And they start on mm, mm, their own development. And the, it wasn't the case of any uh, centralized religion because it was like a, uh, like in a drive within the Russian people who were not very much satisfied with an official church, with, a, with, with an official order uh, ruled in, in, in Russia. And it was a sort of, to me, a sort of uh, like a natural inspiration coming from this root, root, fo root folk, uh, grassroot folk, not, not from, from uh, uh, educated educated uh, circles and, and uh, where, where, where did this this um once they'd rejected the the kind of uh, scriptural guidance where did this newfound sort of impetus take them as a community but they had their own poetry they had their own poetry their own mantras their own uh, and they used all this poetry all these mantras uh, uh in in the sermons it's also similar to uh, western uh, charismas it, when they speak on different languages something remember the sto story uh, even in the new testament and this uh, the, the apostles they spoke 
a new absolutely new language. So it's a case of charisma. Say so. So was the case of of, of Russian uh, uh, God's people. Sometimes they spoke uh, and quite just in Russian, uh, a folk's poetry like "Oh Holy Spirit, come in, does I love you, does give me salvation" or something like that. And they whirling like dervishes in uh, Oriental dervishes or like in uh, in uh, Hindu ascetics. And sometimes they spoke unknown languages, just like in the charismats. And all this was a, just a part of the um, uh, sermon. Formally, they were orthodox because of the very strong rules in the Russian Empire, as they should be orthodox. Otherwise, they might be punished very severely. And sometimes, really, the state, if if uh, the police will check, will find uh, this kind of uh, sect, they should oppress it very, very in a very hard way. But basically, they had their own circles. They call it uh, like ships, uh, ships of salvation, like arch, uh, better to say, the arches of salvation. And they, in every arch has its own Christ, its own, sometimes its own Godfather, their own sense. And uh, yes, and they used the Christian names and uh, the Christian rhetorics, but uh, the very drive was absolutely different. And uh, in, it's also strange that in certain way they remind me the Chinese folks uh, mysticism. So if in even in the modern China and especially in the medieval China, we have some some folk sects where the people call themselves Buddha or Bodhisattva or something else, and the people believe that there is not only one Buddha, Buddha Shakyamuni, uh, who is known in the history, but every every. Everyone can be a Buddha. And so they have their own uh, like inner alchemy, their own met uh, methods to be Buddha and their own poetry and everything was very, very similar. Even those Chinese, mm, uh, according to their theology, if you, so you have uh, a, within yourself a, part of, a particle of uh, uh, old heaven, so to say. The old heaven is the, the spiritual heaven and in new heaven, this is the material heaven. And this very small piece of old heaven you have inside yourself, and you just you got it from your your ancestry, from your parents, and they from their own parents, and so uh, according to this uh, uh, connection between uh, your ancestors, at last you are getting this uh, the, the, uh, the 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 piece of uh, the particle of of old heaven. And you should cultivate this particle within yourself, just praying ancestors who might help you. And also you should really to support this piece of, of, of uh, inner light by means of special breathing and mantras and uh, movements and everything what we, we know as a, as a Chinese, Chinese sometimes martial arts or cyber Chinese yoga and so, so on and so forth. And then you in a certain, uh, condition you feel yourself like to be pregnant the pregnant with this immortal in immortal uh, being within yourself and then you should it, it's already not your uh, mortal nature it's your immortal nature and you feel like to be pregnant with it and then you should cultivate it this, this golden egg you should cultivate it and then at last you should be born as a buddha in the heaven same was the case with this russian uh, with the Russian God's people. So sometimes even men, they feel like they are pregnant. They are pregnant with the light and they cultivated it also holding the breathing, special breathing exercises, special dancing and the mantras and everything. Uh, so it, it looks for, to me, it looks like really uh, the grassroots folk, grassroots people, absolutely non-educated people who are not still spoiled with all this metaphysical the stuff they have a really strong connection first to the nature, to the ecology, and also to the natives, uh, natives and, and, and uh, ancestors, because the ancestors, they are also the part of our ecological system in a certain way, uh, not just culturally, yes, but also uh, really existentially. So this uh, grassroots people, they still have this connection and sometimes they can get this revelation, understanding the nature of, of this whole pre-monotheistical uh, stuff uh, going back to their roots. And they're, ex they're exercising it, but they're exercising it not according to any kind of metaphysics or any instructions. They exercise it 
uh, using their natural intuition, uh, the cosmical intuition, and, and also a sort of social intuition as well, because they built their own society in accordance with those intuitive principles. And what is interesting, um, so some the few historians in, in, uh, in the Soviet Union and in New Russia, they really noticed that the early Soviet system, basically this uh, socialist solidarity, and then uh, this, this uh, the absolutely the new nomenclature in, in, in the Soviet Russia, which was not a part of, of old uh, aristocratical nomenclature, say so they really came from, from those uh, families of old believers, and they tried to, uh, to, manifest, uh, to manifest their own understanding of, of truth. So that's, uh, so to say, the mystical part of Bolshevism, so to say, the mystical part of Bolshevism, which is not based on Marx or on, on uh, the Western economy, but somehow more on, on the people's intuition. Uh, Seth. Uh, so, um, could I ask, did this uh, clearly uh, very active uh, internal life that these, these people have, did it uh, re result in um, the, the community th thriving in other uh, fields, such as it, it, uh, did, did, it, did it become quite uh, um, uh, economically healthy? Did, did it spawn uh, new styles maybe of architecture or dance or poetry culture? Did it, did it, yeah, did it, did it give birth to, to some really concrete expression of, of, this, of this particular vision that they had of how to live? Yes, some of old believers were very, very health uh, uh, mighty economically, and they even sponsored the Russian Revolution because they they fought against Romanovs because they believe the Romanovs are foreigners, and Romanovs are just the Satanists. So, and they try to to <laughs> just to annihilate the the um, uh, Romanovs, and that's why they supported revolution. Uh, from one side, and they were really like healthy and uh, financially and uh, very, very mighty. But uh, they didn't succeed because in, in, after the few years after revolution, the Soviet powers start oppressing these people as well uh, because it was already a different, a different story. It was still mostly like international mafia coming from the Western, uh, uh, the third international and, and so on. And then these people lost. And uh, the last uh, arch of all believers or the God's people were uh, ch uh, found somewhere after the Second World War in the 50s. And then they, were, they went completely in the underground already. And now it's a big uh, discussion in the uh, scientific circles. Are these people still alive or they are not alive? <laughs> uh, but I, I believe, my opinion is, uh, if you just and try to understand this, uh, this story in terms of academical science. Yes, so maybe you can't find anything. But in terms of a natural intuition of people, you can find even in the modern Russia some, some, something similar, similar, uh, uh, some, some, some uh, results. Uh, uh, appearances, for example, uh, from time to time in 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 Russia or in in the former Soviet Union, the, the, uh, on on the scene are coming out people who proclaim themselves to be gods, in Siberia, in Ural, somewhere else, uh, that they really like have an inspiration that they are not just uh, the saints, but they are gods themselves, and and. It, it, like, it's not is that perhaps something which is much more common in uh, in Russian culture for people to uh, take their own sort of s s um, spiritual kind of experiences very seriously, whereas in 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 this country, say in the last uh, you know, hundred years, it's only a very few people that have, have ever made those sort of claims. Whereas it's much more acceptable, maybe in 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 Russian culture. I, yes, I think yes, because uh, the, uh, most of the Russians believe they are chosen folk, chosen folk, chosen people, but not chosen people in. Uh, in the Jewish sense of chosen mm. people, they they believe because they they are carriers of of the Holy Spirit, and uh, 
I can give you an example also from the Western example. For example, uh, this author of the myth of 20th century, the Alfred Rosenberg, he wrote in his book that every German is a god, just literally. And then you should understand your German nature as you are, you are god and just forget all kind of the uh, hostile propaganda against it. So mm -hmm. he, and he was admirer of, uh, he was admirer of, um, what was the, the very well-known German mystics in the medieval, uh, not Meister Eckhart. Meister Eckhart, exactly. Because Meister Eckhart, he, the, the scripture of Meister Eckhart are almost like a sort of a Western advaita. He really ex ex yeah, ex yeah. described his experience like he was in contact with the, with the God. And maybe he couldn't ex describe everything because of the censorship. Mm -hmm. But it's like also in, in German mysticism of Jacob Böhme and other people. And uh, yeah. you can find uh, this inspiration as well somehow so, so vladimir what what do you think that uh, we we should uh, what, what what one uh, um can learn from the, this example of a people obviously we're in a slightly different culture but uh, is it to uh not be afraid of a much more immediate engagement with 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 the divine with the gods i believe that Especially nowadays, yes, uh, when the, you, you have a plenty of all kinds of speculations and everything, the, uh, uh, it should be nice to exercise your real, your independent connections to the divine. That understand, to understand that according to the unity of, of universe, you are part of everything. You are just a part of Big Bang, and Big Bang started with you. Your origin is not in some <laughs> in a certain uh, ethnical or historical roots. Your origin is in the Big Bang itself. And so you are Big Bang, you are just, uh, and you can go back to the Big Bang. And I believe the modern physics already is coming up very, very close to this revelation. Take, uh, let's say the Roger Penrose, a well-known British yeah. physicist. He is already, he's coming very, very close according to his intuition. And he said, I can't explain you, but I feel I am right. Because yes, he can't explain because he is really like binded with a, uh, ties of Western mathematics and mathematically you can't you can't just prove it. And my guru Michael Tam, he also he said even like 60 years ago that the modern science can't just describe the whole nature of human being at, at all because the nature is much more deep. You just the, the mathematics can help you in a, in a certain ways, but you can't just rely on it completely. You should just be more mystical. You should just overcome this, this karmical suggestion of your environment, of your cultural heritage and everything. Just try to understand you are a cosmical being. And that's the point. And you can find this kind of people in, in modern India even now, I believe in somewhere, some other countries as well. Probably also in, in the West, I, I, I believe. But the only point is that those mystics who really understand the unity of being, the unity of everything, the real nature of the ancestors, they are just uh, not uh, fighting for, for media or for business, for anything like that. And remember uh, our, our friend, this, the uh, Lil uh, explained about um, Baha'i. She said, no, you, you can sponsor only Baha'i, not, not, not others. It looks like a sort of a family business. And almost uh, the family business, uh, you can in the, in the Middle East, you can find a, a lot of sects exercising the same family business, like Druze in Syria, mm. and uh, this Baha'i on Islam, Ismailites, and uh, Mandians, and the uh, Alawites, and uh, even uh, the uh, Hasids, uh, and, and so on. Everybody are just fixed on their own community. And then uh, you, you are not allowed to sponsor everybody else. You just sh should keep all the money, but it's like a sort of family business. It has nothing to do with the spirituality, with the cosmical experience, because it's something like, uh, yes, the business is business, business as usual, by means of you can uh, get right now, right away. Uh, mm -hmm. But as for, uh, uh, my opinion is, if you are looking to exercise your spiritual nature, you should stay close to the nature, yes, go to forest and just meditate, open your mind and, and try to understand you are the part of, uh, of universe, uh, like I'm doing in our Highgate Wood. I go to Highgate Wood, it's like my environment, <laughs> and, and then you are the part of, it's uh, 
or even if you are somewhere in a very, very abandoned place, it's even better uh, if you can find uh, a, a possibility to spend somewhere in the country house, maybe, maybe sometime. But it's, as I said, it, you cannot monetize this story. It's just a part of your inner cosmical identity, not a part of your somehow the social identity or something like that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more, more nature, more uh, natural mysticism. Hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. No. No. Thank you for that. Um, uh, would anyone like like to um, oh make any comments or ask Vladimir anything? I mean that the the, the 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 conversation has has sort of uh, expanded really. I I, I think so. If, if anyone uh, um, I th I think uh, uh, have you uh, um, have you had much contact with. Uh, Many, many uh, of, the, of these spiritually dissident groups in, in, in Russia on your travels? Yes, I know some persons, not only in Russia. I, I really like to contact people who, who understand their cosmic heritage. And also in India, for example, or in Europe and, or United States. Uh, also, the, the, there are some people in, in, in Russia. But I believe the most uh, developed person in that case was my guru Michael Tam because he was initially he he spoke about this story and he he studied uh, nuclear physics in, in uh, pre-war Germany and he was really like uh, aware of everything and then he said he said uh, at a certain point after the war shortly after the war he understood that you can't just mathematically describe everything and then if you if you try to release all things scientifically. This, the scientific mind itself is a part of our waking state, and the waking state do not cover the whole, uh, uh, like the whole area of, of your experience. Uh, that's why the waking state is just a very, very uh, limited state, and you should also explore your dreaming state and the state of deep dream, deep sleep, and go more, more and more within yourself, and then like uh, going inside yourself you reach uh, the limits of universe. And then at last, uh, how do you say this? The, uh, this radiation after the Big Bang, this radioactivity after the Big Bang, that's also the part of you. So the, the, the ultimate border of our universe are just the, the, the border of you, of yourself. And then it's really, and you are really connected to the to, to this. And then your own body is not a physical body, but you, your body is the body of universe. And then, as a human person, you have your own uh, uh, consciousness, and you can operate with this consciousness. And then you think you understand something not, and your intuitions are based on your consciousness. But if you realize that your body is, and not just uh, if you realize, if you connect expand your body by certain like mystical and alchemical um, technology and if you realize that your body is the body of universe then you have this uh, another sort of consciousness which give you a revelation about everything what's going to happen but again you you can't explain it to the ordinary people because they are just uh, like in the box of of their waking state conditions and priorities and motivations yeah yeah, I, th I think uh, I, I, I think a lot of this should be done on a person-to-person -person basis, and I think the the, the the guru principle that is prevalent with with India is is very good. That it's it's person-to-person. -person. I, I think that that isn't is, is important for these yes. to, to be impressed. Uh, uh, yes, and also uh, fasting is very 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 good. Uh, it was also uh, the practice of all believers and uh, of uh, God's people. Heavy fast and uh, isolation and all this uh, all we can say a special retreat if you fast i would i i'm sure if you fast 40 days just water then you will be almost buddha they remember the way the buddha got his his revelation he was looking for knowledge looking and and, and uh, visiting different places speaking to different people and then he said oh everything is not 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 enough now I'm going to fast until I die or I'll get the revelation. And he's, he sat uh, under the tree and he spent uh, several days in, the, in, in this fasting and in the meditation and uh, mm. think I wouldn't uh, move myself until I get the revelation. Mm. And he was about to die. And in these conditions, 
his body, like his his physical enemy, understood that yes, I I I body I will die if I won't give him uh, all the secrets I, I I keep in myself as a part of universe. And he got the revelation. And then Buddha said, yes, no, you shouldn't be extreme. You should be like always uh, like in the middle state, uh, even balanced. But yes, that's it. But if he didn't fast so many days, probably he, he, he couldn't get the revelation. That, because if you, are, if you are fasting, yes, now I'm at the prophet as a fasting. If you are fa your body is fasting, you do not have too much energy for any, any additional uh, uh, construction, for any additional intellectual activity. Then you go back to the, to the basics, back to the basics. Mm. And all your inner energies are coming to the stomach and they can concentrate in in this point of your uh, of your life, uh, the navel and uh, the area where uh, this particle of old heaven is kept, mm -hmm. and that's that's the point. So the heavy as just a, as a practical uh, way, heavy fasting plus pranayama, ex breathing exercises. So if you try to operate with your breathing, you make it slower, you make it more uh, uh, mild. And then just be exercising with a, a pranayama is exercising with your inner uh, energy as well. And then if you get the feedback and you understand that your, your uh, breathing is, not, is also the part of, of this cosmical energy. And then we have the great breath of Brahma, which lasts the whole life of our universe. And, and you, you are doing uh, within a minute, maybe like 15 inhales and exhales, but all these are connected uh, in a certain resonance. And you, if your personal uh, breathing is connected to the Brahma, the cosmical Brahma, and you get this resonance, then you should understand that as a Hindu say, Tatva Masi, you are, you are him, though you are. That, that one is, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think we, yeah, we need to move things towards a, a conclusion, but thanks very much um, for your very, yeah, very um, animated, as, as always, um, uh, speech, um, Vladimir, uh, with your connections with many traditions. Uh, does anyone have any comment or um, question uh, for Vladimir before I to close the meeting? I just want to say that was very illuminating. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Bern. Thank you. Um, Thank you, friends, for 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 watching me and for <laughs> using your time. Yeah. No. No. I want to just ask uh, Vladimir. You mentioned the term paganistic mentality. Could you just elucidate on that a little further? What what you meant by by that? I mean, that's just the nature of mentality, the understanding you are part of universe. You are part of not just nature, but nature is a part of universe. And universe is a part of, of, of being. And that's the paganistic mentality means that there is no difference between you and Godfather and nature and everything is in one. And your, your inner, the very core identity is exactly the identity of, of, of creator. Like uh, Yogi said, the Samadhi of Mahashiva, Mahashiva is the Samadhi of Yogin himself. So in a certain way, you, your identity uh, and the identity of, uh, of this master of universe is, is the same, but you should just uh, uh, not just realize it intellectually, but to connect to it with a, by, by magical means of this unity somehow to, to exercise it. And that's already uh, starts uh, the mysticism uh, or religion, uh, the unity religion to, to, to bind one with another. So the, the, this global connection uh, and the, where you are the part of it, you are just, uh, you are the core witness of everything, not just the core witness of your life. You are the core witness of the existence of the whole universe. That's the point. So that, that is for me, the pagan, uh, mentality. So the mentality before institutionalized religions um, seeking for social uh, manipulation by coming to to the historical scene, and the people start to be manipulated by by uh, official uh, by, by officials of all kind of of them because they officials are, they're based on economy uh, 
uh, that is their priority and their motivation, not just the cosmos, which is absolutely maybe uh, doesn't bring you any 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 materialistic uh, any material success or something like that, because it's just uh, uh, the cosmos doesn't care who are you well, in your just, social well, life. Do, 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 does, does that uh, seem to you? Uh be covered by the terms of paganistic or, or would you have a have a different uh, different view but, uh, who are you asking me that yes to, yeah do, do you agree with no, that because obviously, uh, you know you know I'm, I'm i understand and i think what vladimir is saying is that i i think you're identifying mysticism itself as paganistic until it gets uh narrowed down by a particular religious interpretation institutional religious interpretations. Mm. I think you're saying that the mystic idea of the oneness and, and and identification with the all is really a pagan idea, which then gets narrowed down subsequently. Mm. Yes, and uh, in certain way, I believe also uh, that if you check this Western Protestantism, so we have the same idea that you should not have any anyone between you and God, but we, so we are, we are one, but, but it's still, uh, it's not, uh, they didn't, uh, uh, articulate themselves uh, enough, uh, I mean, the Protestants, but it's already something, uh, something very, very close to, to, to the story, because uh, you shouldn't have anybody between you and, and, and uh, the highest principle. Secondly, I believe that the Western science, uh, like uh, the stop phys physics and mathematics, the Western science is also the product of Western society. And the, exactly the Western science is something which might under help uh, the people to understand this unity, that to understand it not on a, on, in, in a way of uh, uh, superstitions, some religious superstitions, or just blind belief in something. Yeah. But in a certain way, I, I see that the, the top Western science is coming close to, 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 the, to the mystical experiences. And they, even Dalai Lama said, yes, uh, he's an admirer of Western science. And he said, I, in, in, really, I am just admirer of Western science more than I admire of, of Buddhism. And Buddhism should should be re re reformed according to the Western science. Yes, but that's that's his his point. But but basically, yes, uh, uh, I believe that we uh, like also the carriers of Western science. Uh, we shouldn't just uh, ignore it and say, "Oh, this science is something." Uh, the, uh, that's the misunderstanding uh, because I believe this the very. Very, very subtle intuitions, which you can find by Western scientists, are also very close. They're coming back to the unity of, of universe, but from somehow, like if you go inside yourself, uh, then you you face uh, the, the whole universe. Same if you exercise like this Western science, try to understand uh, the latest uh, drive with the latest uh, 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 the latest uh, revelations of the, of the Western science, especially as, uh, in, in terms of this quantum physics and the universe and everything. So I, I, I think I inspire you. I think truth is truth uh, from whatever uh, avenue one one approaches it. Uh, I think that may may be um, something you, you you're, you're expressing, which I think is yeah, it will. Is, is a good thing because we, we've all got access to some avenue whether it's the, the, the mystical or the more scientific avenue to, to pursue um I, I i think unless anyone's got any any i think you know uh we, we, we should perhaps bring this uh meeting to a, a close i'll just say a few words and i shall i shall uh, uh blow out the candle um i'm at quellis galda glorifa, cono e prende, maki e ruinde e moia gevine, isa ive kemur, ul e turket e, right not skal quelled loifa. Blessed gods of our peoples and lands, at evening shall one praise the day, and at night shall one praise the evening. 
we offer thanks for what we have profited by and for what we found pleasure in. Sigur idur, sigur idur, sigur os, sigur os. Prida idur, prida idur, prida os, prida os. Hey, look. Thanks, thanks very much, Vladimir. Uh, Lil had, had to go, but that, that was very good. Thanks uh, to everyone who's, who's, who's made a uh, contribution and stayed to hear the, 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 the conclusion. Um, uh, yeah, uh, to, to, Tony, are, are you? Um, yeah, perhaps we can meet, meet for for a, uh, um, uh, a brief discussion. Maybe yeah, if you hang on afterwards. I well, um, are you? Are you? Um, yeah, um, yeah. Perhaps we'll 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 just we'll just talk afterwards. I think. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll contact you. That's that's the best thing. Um, all right, well, I'll, I'll I'll wish everyone a, a an enjoyable Sunday. Um, good to see you, Mike, Mike, Michael, as as always, and good to have some new 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 people on on board. Uh, thanks, Bjorn, for coming. Um, James Cheers. and Kane and Ben, thank, 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 thanks very much. So have a, have a good Sunday. Hopefully I'll see, I'll see you all on the next bloat, which will be at the end of the, the month on the last Sunday. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye everyone, bye-bye. Goodbye, see you later.